Assalamu alaikum and welcome to a new episode of Karbala Reflections. I'm joined today by Sister Amina Ilnos and Sara Bukhari to discuss some of the topics that we can pick up on and learn from from the events of Ashura. I'd like to discuss truth today, truthhood, what it means, what it stands for. Um, ultimately, I think truth is the essence of Islam. It fortifies everything there is in the Quran. But what is the truth anyways? What is truth? I think there's an absolute reality which is um, reflected in having a perfected creator. And I think that truth is something on a very pragmatic level, something which he um, delivered to us and conveyed to us through the use of messengers, through the actions of Athelbait, through the inheritors, the successors. And I think that truth is, I mean, there's no one answer to this question, but that truth is something which we strive to um, reflect in our own day-to-day -day lives. It's something which we've been given guidance to since the beginning of creation, um, since the existence of man, since the existence of man as an essence, not just man as a material being. So that truth is something which has always been with us, always will be with us, and it's up to us how much we really connect to it and um, manifest it in our own lives. Yeah, but I feel sometimes um, it's, it's confusing to figure out what's the truth and what's not the truth. Do you think it's as simple as saying that the truth is what has been revealed by God and the Ahlul Bayt only? No, I, I concur with what you said. The truth is Allah. Allah identifies himself if we can use a gendered pronoun for Allah, as the truth. Uh, truth is something that is persistent and lasting. Uh, Allah speaks of himself in the Holy Quran as the truth, and the truth is something that endures, whereas falsehood is something that disappears. Um, the truth throws itself against falsehood, and falsehood perishes. Now, of course, in our temporal transient lives, this does take a while. A untruth may persist for a day or a year or generation or beyond that, but ultimately it evaporates. And definitely in the broader scale of things, so to speak, when we combine this world with whatever is to come, what is untrue definitely does not persist. So this is the root of truth and everything else is a manifestation of that or an outgrowth of that. And as you mentioned, Allah in the Holy Quran identifies uh, his words in the book of Allah as we have received them also as as truth. So as expressions of the attribute of Allah, which is truth, which uh, within the school of Ahlul Bayt, we don't, we don't separate it out from the other attributes. We don't say the truth is different from the light or the mercy or something else. Uh, these are all one in the same. Now, as for the capacity of the human being to recognize the truth, I feel like we've talked about this sometime before, but I'll repeat myself because Allah repeats. We have truth sensing organs. We have one up here. The intellect. Now again, the intellect can get confused, but we can use logic and reason, inshallah, to ascertain the truth if, if we are using them correctly. It's like a car. If a car is not working properly, it's not going to go somewhere. But if it's all tuned up well and it's got its oil and its petrol and stuff, it will get there. Same with the intellect. If it's working correctly, it will detect the truth. But how often do people not use their intellects correctly? And there is the fitra, an inborn knowledge of the truth. It's in our DNA to recognize Allah as the truth, to recognize ethical truths as the truth, to recognize anything that is fundamental and foundational as the truth. It's encoded in us. Hey, don't take that literally, by the way. I'm not saying our fitra is literally in our DNA. I don't know where it is, but it's somewhere. It's like our DNA. And we have the heart. And the heart does not get confused. It's narrated from Imam Sadiq, peace be upon him, that even for the kuffar, the, the heart is not confused either about the nature of Allah or about the truth. So why is it that so many people do go astray? God forbid, may Allah prevent me from being among them. As narrated from... I think they forget. Forgetfulness we is do, one thing. Yeah, yes. we do have an ayah in the Quran that's, you know, um, I, I can't quote it word mm. for word, but to the meaning of, you know, when you're in the ocean and you're stuck, you're going to pray to God, you're going mm. to want someone to help you, and you're going to feel it within you that there is a, a bigger power, someone who can save you. But the continuation of that verse, as far as I remember, is that when you go back to the shore, when you get back to safety, you are going to forget. 
I think that's one of the problems we face. This relates to the general human condition that we are all capable of perceiving a law, perceiving the truth, perceiving many things, but we distance ourselves from a law through many things, including the various desires, self love, ego, etc. However, I was going to mention something else too for Barakah, inshallah, it's narrated from Imam Ali, peace be upon him. And inshallah, the viewers are all doing salawat, as some communities do when you say the name of the commander of the faithful. That the reason why people get confused about the truth, in addition to what you said, which is very correct, and obviously the Book of Allah is very correct, is that it gets mixed up with falsehood. So the example he used is the example of a copper coin that someone comes and plates with silver. Because back in the olden days, the coin was worth the metal. So if you had a copper coin, it was real copper and it was worth the value of copper. If you had a silver coin or a gold coin, it was 100% silver or gold, inshallah. Yeah. So the idea is what you had is exactly what you had. It's not like today. But if you took a copper coin and you plated it with silver, you're mixing up the truth and the falsehood. So because they're mixed together, that's why people have difficulty distinguishing them. Otherwise, if you just have falsehood in one place, truth in another place, people are not going to be confused. Yeah, I mean, definitely in this day and age with um, all the terrorists and the extremists around us, that's definitely a mixture of falsehood, a very big ratio of falsehood um, being disguised as the truth and uh, being disguised as Islamic truth. And sadly, a lot of people seem to be falling for it. Well, this is also a narrative from the Imams too, that a lot of falsehood, I think it's also a narrative from Imam Ali, peace be upon him, it's dressed up in the ayat of the Book of Allah. People use the verses and the ayat of the Book of Allah to present things or untruth simply by placing them in a wrong way. So again, that's where the intellect and the heart come in. Someone can tell me something and they can tell me the Quran says this or that, but have I read the ayah? Have I pondered the ayah? Have I exposed the ayah to my heart? Am I listening to that voice in my conscience? If we all did that, then inshallah, we would not pray to such, fall pray to such things. And again, the most important thing is the one we always forget. And that is to ask Allah to guide us to the truth. Absolutely. When does it happen that someone asks Allah for guidance and Allah does not provide? It happens very quickly. Allah guides those who open their hearts to it and ask. So inshallah, perhaps we can have a mass um, ummah prayer session for being guided to the truth and being open to it. And then we won't have any more problems like this. Inshallah. 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 I think a lot of it has to do with istighfar as well. It's your perception of reality. It's like when you have a lens and you're looking through glasses, for example, and you know, your lens has all this muck on it. You haven't cleaned it for like two, three months. And, you know, you're going to be looking through a lens that's just, you know, not able to see reality for what it is. And I think in a very, like, you know, metaphorical sense, that's what we do to our own souls. And there's a hadith that says, for example, tears purify your soul like water purifies in in the similar way. And I think that that whole, even Muharram time on the theme of Karbala, the whole purpose of remembering messages of truth is so that we are able to embody it, we're able to reflect on it, we're able to become um, aligned to it. And I think a lot of that has to do with istighfar, it has to do with your own connection. Um, just remembering what Imam Hussein did brings tears to people's eyes. Just yeah. the remembrance and the recalling of his tragedy puts people in a state of mourning. And this even, I think, is directly linked to this, um, not falling for this illusion of this world. Uh, there's so many ways to fall for, like you said, falsehoods, to, way, um, to fall for idols that we create for ourselves. Um, you know, I think in the, in the latter days, idol worshipping was a very physical thing. You know, there's literally idols in the Kaaba. There's literally idols in Mecca. And I think nowadays we self-create our own idols. We self-create these partners that we associate to that oneness. And that oneness is peace. And I think in a lot of ways, sometimes we need to just direct ourselves back to that that path where you just feel truth is peace in the end of the day. I think that's where people, even if you're in the middle of turmoil, and I love that um, verse of the Holy Quran where Prophet Musa alayhi salam, is just stuck, basically. He's between the ocean, the Red Sea, and he's stuck between the ocean and Fir'aun's army. And in that moment, you know, somebody calls out and says, we are being overtaken. And he says, no, my Lord is going to find me a way out. I think that in itself is, is an embodiment of a moment of truth, that peace and contentment he felt knowing that there's certainty in a truth 
that is what gets people through the most difficult situations in life. And I think really that's what Karbala reflects for us. Mashallah. Oh, thank you. And I think, I think that's definitely the first, found, like the foundation of what we need to have in order to go to the next step, which is not only to recognize the truth, but to be able to, to stand for it. Because ultimately what Imam Hussein and his family and his companions, peace be upon them all, did on Ashura wasn't just see the truth. The truth was very obvious for a long time to those who chose to see exactly how you said. But the hard part comes when it, com when it comes down to standing for the truth. And in this day and age, it's getting a bit harder and harder. Again, I believe we have a hadith from Imam Ali alayhi salam that says, holding to your, onto your deen uh, later on is like holding a ball of fire. It's very, very hard to hold on to the truth and to the sacredness of your religion. And I can see that. I can see that around me. How do you think we can try to stand up for the truth? Let me put the question back to you. In your experience, what are some of the real life in practice ways that you see people who are struggling to stand for the truth? I don't mean theoretical things like obviously we know there's hadith about the importance of standing before a tyrant. Many of us don't do that. No, some of us do, uh, including uh, within um, the Muslim world, it happens that people are killed because they stand before tyrants. Maybe, maybe we know or knew people like that. So I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I'm saying in, in your everyday life, because you say it's difficult, uh, what are some of the challenges you, you see around you? Um, so, yeah, like you said, obviously, I think martyrdom is the ultimate goal, but it's, it's not something that affects us all on a daily basis. Um, for example, something I read on the news recently was about uh, the Swedish girl who um, just received compensation for refusing to shake hands at an interview that she mm -hmm. was at. And the interview ended when the interviewer realized she wasn't willing to shake his hand. That is standing for truth in our daily life, I believe. That is her standing for her religion, which is her truth. And I'm sure it was hard, it went to court, but she received the compensation at the end. But the, the way and the path that it took for her to get there and to get recognition wasn't easy because I'm sure she needed that job. She got rejected from that job. Personal experience, for example, with me when I was younger, I used to compete in martial arts. And um, I remember very clearly when I was only around 10 or 11 and I used to wear the hijab, I went to have a competition in France and um, I used to wear a maqna, so you know, it doesn't have any metal pieces or any pins. And they refused to allow me to play because they said, um, you know, it goes against their health and safety um, European laws, which it didn't, obviously, because I had been playing in the UK for a long time. That was really hard for me mm. um, at a very young age. But um, I, I felt like I had, I had it in me. And I'm glad that I was able to do that. But I feel that these, these incidences that occur are getting more and more in people's lives. They're happening more regularly and it becomes really difficult because sometimes you don't, you don't see a positive outcome to you standing for the truth. But that's what I think we should work on, not doing it for the outcome of this life because you could possibly suffer to try and stand for the truth and there's no positive outcome in this world. But think, we need to be ready um, for that. In very practical ways as well, I think. Um, a lot of situations where we do challenge ourselves as to if we're going to stand up or not, it's because on the other side, there's um, a popular number of people who are narrating a certain narrative, which you feel compelled to um, either, you know, or pressure to just go along with it. And that's a sort of passive acceptance of falsehood. I wouldn't say, for example, a lot of people will say, well, I'm just being diplomatic or I'm just keeping quiet because I'm trying to keep the peace. But in my heart, I know that, for example, this is wrong, you know, and I think these are some of the practical things that even, you know, like yours was a very, it's a personal thing that happened to you. I think everyone in this day and age suffers from yeah. very personal circumstances that end up, you know, questioning your own position. And then it's a matter of confusion, you know, it's, for example, if my friends are saying something, if my family is saying something or, you know, my my university professors are telling me that I can't say a certain thing. These things are 
what really tests our stance. And it's not going to be something as big as, you know, you physically see your imam in front of you. I think that's the challenge of it, you know? So I think a lot of young girls, a lot of young guys in the communities that we live in, they're at every level, these things are not, it's not never a massive thing that comes in front of your face like an elephant in the room that you're like, oh my God, yes, that, I need to stand up against it. It's always the very little things that yeah. I feel end up shaping us in the long run, you know? Definitely. And like the prophet says, little things add up and they make a difference in the long run in your perception. So um, I think I, I relate. I think everybody relates that it's things are very hard at times, especially I think being a youth in these this day and age and certain you know, um, cultures that we live in. But again, it's something which requires a lot of will. Yeah, how do you think we can strengthen our will though? There are many ways to strengthen willpower. Salat itself, although it shouldn't be the primary reason why one prays to Allah, nonetheless, the discipline strengthens willpower. Fasting strengthens willpower. Salat al strengthens willpower. M much of what's mentioned uh, with respect to Sharia and religious practice strengthens willpower. All, all of these things work together. With respect to standing up for one's own truth. I, I guess that's in English more what we would call integrity because people have different worldviews about what they believe is right and wrong. And not every single person is going to share, let me rephrase this differently. There, there's such thing as universal truths, we believe. Like we believe it's wrong to, to kill, except maybe in some circumstances like killing a murder. You know, we don't believe there's ethical relativism from these angles, but it sounds like some of the conflicts you're describing are cases where human beings don't agree on, on what is true or what is right. Uh, it's more of an issue of standing up for one's uh, personal beliefs, which is, I think, a slightly different thing and shouldn't be conflated with standing for universally agreed upon truths. But to acknowledge that it's standing up for one's own belief system I, I think is very healthy and is respected. People will respect someone who says, for example, it's my religion that I don't, um, I don't, I don't eat pork, for, for example. I, I mean, that's obviously a simple example, but it's been a, uh, a serious issue in some times during the Inquisition, for example, some people were, um, they attempted to force them to eat pork to prove they're not Jews or Muslims in the Roman Empire, it was an issue with Jews, etc. Uh, and that's something that, um, it's, it's not only about willpower, I think it's about the things that at the end of the day you're happy with yourself about because when we compromise whatever we feel is important, then we don't feel good about ourselves at the end of the day and it's something we may regret, regret 10, 20 years down the line. It might even be something small like a bite of ham, for example, that maybe yeah. someone ate to please someone. It's not, ham is not an issue of universal truth. If the viewers will forgive me on that. It's not one of those major moral issues, but nonetheless, it's it's against what you, what you believe you should be doing. And for that reason, there'll be a sort of embarrassment with the soul with it, because the soul has dignity. Allah has created the soul with dignity. Uh, and when we do something that's against our inside, it brings about humiliation. And that's something that takes us further away from Allah and our purpose of creation in this life. Perhaps keeping that in mind helps. Uh, but as for willpower, back to the original question, anything that strengthens willpower in increases willpower. Yeah. I think um, the quote just popped to my mind. Uh, if you stand for nothing, you will fall for anything. Mm. And I think that goes back to what you were saying about it's the small stuff. Mm. Um, it's the small stuff we need to try and stand up for. Um, whether, like you said, it's a universal truth or whether it's an individual truth. As long as it's the truth that we have been given to us by our religion, for example, even the you know the pork example that you gave, it's not an, a universal truth for everyone, but it is definitely a truth for Muslims. And therefore, if we could still categorize it as an individual truth, but nonetheless, it is something that we need to make a stand for if you know the problem arises or if the opportunity comes. Um, but yeah, I think I think we're getting better at it as a society. I think it's becoming easier um, to to get used to not 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 always being conformed. 
I think the society we're in now is always trying to put a lot of emphasis on being open and being um, being one, everyone kind of being the same, right? But it's not necessarily always the best thing, I think. Sometimes individuality um, is, is positive. Sometimes you have to do the right thing, even if it makes you stand out. Um, even if you're in the minority, you should stand for what you believe in. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think in terms of universal truths as well, um, obviously when we talk about Karbala, you can speak about the very practical things which were standing up for the truth, you know, in that situation, for example. And then, like you said, there's those universal truths that echo throughout time. And their stances which are so incredibly selfless. I think that's where I would draw the line, like between, for example, something which really irks me and I feel like, you know what, I need to I need to speak to someone about this right now. I think we all have those moments and like you said, it's for the sake of your religion at times. And then there's those moments where literally you have everything to lose, you have nothing to win really in a, in a material world and you have to just put yourself out there because, you know, I have to do what's right. And I think in, in that sense, these universal truths and for example, Sheikh Nimo, a scholar who really embodies in our generation what it means to sacrifice, you know, for this idea of universal truth. Because what he did wasn't beneficial for him. What he did ended up, you know, making him endure conditions that no human being, okay, in a very physical martyrdom sense. But then there's that jihad of the nafs, which in order to even reach that physical sense, you have to go through that process of purification of the self before you even have the honor of doing that absolutely you know and I think as a leader he's such a good example because you know I remember going through the streets of Karbala I remember in the in the years that he was imprisoned and just seeing pictures of him everywhere and I thought this man like he comes from an area of hijaz where you know not everybody is going to automatically know who this person is but sometimes the simple truths that one person speaks or the embodiment of that truth, the actions which inherently um, embody that truth, it, it has a ripple effect. It has something which touches people's hearts. And that's why they say when a person speaks from their heart, it touches other people's hearts because it has that, truth has that, that essence about it where no matter where you are in the world, no matter what generation you're in, what Imam Hussein did can, we've seen it so many times in videos, you know, of non-Muslims hearing his story and just being moved by it. Because it's something which touches that fitra, like you mentioned, that inner fitra, that nature of a human being, that this man really, like, there was no personal motive in his political stance. People can call it politics, but where was the selfishness in what he did? What did he gain other than nothing, you know? Yeah. And his family didn't. So I think that reminder sometimes perspective and truth is huge because it's so easy to get caught up. Like, I, I, I feel like, for example, when... Um, I'm away from places of visitation because they are places which completely embody this this essence, this timelessness, this eternity of truth. And you go there and then you're like, oh my gosh, I before I came I had all these um, things in my head that I need to pray for. And then suddenly you're there and you're like, it's not even important anymore. Exactly. Yeah. You know, that perspective and suddenly you not only seek to neutralize yourself and think, okay, I need to re reach an equilibrium where I'm not doing wrong, I'm asking, you know, I'm trying to do a bit better than not doing wrong. Um, but then you seek to strive for something that is far greater and beyond just your existence. You realize you're part of a greater existence. And that truth is what really, I guess, opens your eyes, you know. And without these reminders every year, I think a lot of us would feel like we're completely just, it's almost like an abyss of your own self, you know. You, it's easy to get lost in that darkness of feeling like, and that's why they relate light is truth and truth is light because it's a guidance. I, I agree with what you said 100%, especially the part of bringing up Sheikh Nimr. I feel like in many, many ways, we might not be given an opportunity to make a stand that take, grabs a lot of people's attention. Not that that's necessary, but it's not always going to be a loud stand that we make. It's going to be individual small steps that we take for ourselves. But just reminding ourselves just like what you just did, um, reminding ourselves of these great people, of the great stances they've done, of the message that they delivered, of what they stood for. That in itself is standing for truth as well. Someone else took the major step and 
we will help them in as little way as we could from however far away that we are, whether it's the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam 1,400 and something years later, or whether it's um, an event that took place, I think around two years ago now, right? We should keep reminding ourselves of these things that have happened and these great people. And along the way of trying to become like them, remind people of who they were. Of course, we cannot forget that many shohada are not known, whether in the past and also in the present day, especially in some of the more horrific things that have happened uh, in the past few decades. But Allah knows who they are. Even with respect to what happened in Karbala, not a lot of people know that not all the names of the shohada are known. There are some people who are just referred to by by description or, or a couple words. Some of the companions of Imam Hussein, uh, peace be upon him, we know very clearly what their names are. But in the end, that doesn't matter. It's the, the force of what they put forward that also carries on, uh, whether we are aware of what their names are and we see their picture or not. But yes, that's a beautiful example of how truth does persist and endure and falsehood perishes. And uh, indeed, it is quite true that many tyrants have feared to kill people because they know that to make a martyr out of someone is to make them eternal. Just like the Quran says that um, uh, the verse goes, um, again, not word for word, but uh, do not think of a person who has died in the way of Allah as a martyr, nay, they are alive, um, because their message lives on, as well as other reasons. But Definitely. I'm sure there are so many interpretations of that verse that yeah. we... You know, we don't even understand. Um, I think just on such a just a basic, very basic level that you perceive yourself. And I mentioned the shrines of the martyrs and how it's so recommended to visit them. It's um, we were talking about energy earlier on, the three of us, and we were saying about how you feel good energy. And I think the the most amazing thing about being in places like that is the energy you feel that you don't feel, for example, in a place where you know you're you're constantly working for yourself to mm-hmm. make a livelihood to just get through the day to day. You know. And then suddenly you're in a place where you're like, wow, you know, like, what is this? What, what is this energy you feel next to the body of a martyr? Even that, it's something, if you contemplate on how someone who's dead has such an energy about them, when physically they're severed from this world, you think there's a miracle even in that. You know, okay. subhanAllah, like, it just, it's something which someone who that many years ago has the ability to change you now. And... You know, it just, I think it shows us how much we have to go still, like how much we have to strive to even touch the dust of the dust of these people that that guide us. Definitely. But um, I think um, on our path to try and get to exactly where you're saying, um, maybe the first step, at least for me, is just thank God that Mm -hmm. I'm here for another day to have been get to have been given an opportunity to try and learn from yourself as well as yourself and um, all the all the immortal martyrs that we have lost over the years and use their stories as well as your knowledge um, and your knowledge to help me in my uh, in my growth and my development and um, thank you very humble humble (laughs) and very tactful (laughs) I I really want to thank you uh, sister Amina and sister Sara for joining me today it's been a very insightful um, conversation and um, I'm very glad to have spent the day with you thank you thank you so much for having us